everybody. Welcome back to the Consummate Athlete Podcast. I'm Molly Herford. I write all about bikes, running, outdoor life, occasionally take part in crazy bike or other outdoor adventures, and generally live the consummate athlete lifestyle where possible. I'm Peter Glassford. I am in Moab, Utah, and I am riding my bike this week. But when I'm home, I am a registered kinesiologist and an endurance coach. I like to think that you're those things when you're not home, too, considering we're so very rarely actually home. Yeah, it's hard to say. Hard to say. (laughs) Um, So this week's guest, uh, Jen Jackson, actually turned out to be at the same event that I was at this Sunday, so... I got to uh, get my ass handed to me by today's guest in the (laughs) Howling Coyote Gravel Grinder in Mono, Ontario. Uh, So that was pretty fun. I haven't done a gravel grinder, I realized, in I don't even know how long. It's been a while. It was probably Barry Roubaix in like 2012 or something. Well, you've done Paris to Ancaster. Oh, I guess that's true, yeah. But even that, it's been three years, I think, since I've been able to make it to Paris to Ancaster, which is very sad because I love that race. Yep, yep. It's, it's a good one for sure. Yeah. Um, and then you're, head, you're headed down to a women's weekend this weekend. Yeah. Organized. By, it's organized by a gravel race organizer. <laughs> yep, yep. The Rasputitsa organizers are putting on Bittersweet, so it's going to be a bunch of cool women chatting about bikes. We're going to do some rides. There's a mechanics clinic. Tons of really fun stuff. I'm super stoked for that. Um, yeah, and it was it was cool to actually get out and, you know, kind of do a gravel grinder right before I'm going down to sort of have these conversations about women racing gravel. So, you know, obviously I've done it before, but it was really cool kind of going into it, thinking about, okay, how does this event look and feel as a female cyclist? And, you know, I can totally understand where there's – probably a fair amount of trepidation and inhibition for women because honestly even as you know a fairly competent cyclist there were definitely times where I was a little nervous around some of the guys I was riding with um you know very different technical ability levels and stuff and if you're used to riding with groups of women I it's totally understandable that it would seem really scary Um, I think I'll talk about this on the weekend for women who are coming. Yay. Um, But I think the number one thing I kind of picked up was reminding myself I didn't have to be with any of those groups during the ride, race, whatever you want to call it. Like at any point in time, I could have just pulled off to the side, you know, taken a drink, grabbed a snack, fiddled with my bike, whatever. You know, you don't need to stay with whatever group you're with. And I think that's something that we tend to forget because we try to, like, hang on to whoever's around us, even if they're not the right people for us to be with. Which might be a good life lesson, too? I don't know. Yeah, yeah, it could be. It's definitely it's a challenge in those mass start events, um, you know, that everyone has different abilities. I think probably even irrelevant of gender, but certainly women end up, uh, you know, inevitably they could be really good riders and then end up, you know, with sort of mid-pack people um, who who just, you know, are maybe a bit aggressive for where they are in the race or something, right? So it's, it can be tricky. But, I mean, yeah. sometimes it works out, it sometimes works out really well, too, right? And Oh, my gosh. Um, I have found the nicest guy to ride with for the last maybe, you know, 10K or so. Older gentlemen could not have been nicer or more encouraging or just more pleasant to ride with. And, like, you know, he admittedly couldn't really pull me very much because he was fading pretty hard, so he was hanging out on my wheel a lot. But it was the nicest, like, cheer squad behind me the whole time. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it was great. And then we hit a bit of a downhill coming into the finish, and then the finish finishes in a bit of a soccer field, grass crit style, like cyclocrossy section. So he was leading because we were on a descent, and he was bigger than me, and it was easy for me to tuck in behind him. But as like the finish line came into view, he just pull, he pulls off to the side, and he's like, oh, no, you, you go into it first. And it was probably the nicest interaction that I've had in a race, like, bar none, you know, we finished, we shook hands, he was very sweet, totally made my day. I will also say the Howling Coyote had excellent food, uh, there was a raffle, Shred Girls uh, provided some swag, I had some books there, 
Super fun. And our dear friend Robert actually won that race and he won the series overall. So he's very excited about that. Shout out to Robert. Yeah. Yeah. He's made a great transition. He raced road at a quite high level and you know, it's, it's a very tough sport to break into and he's doing some school and stuff. And so he sort of repurposed himself and he's been dabbling a bit of mountain. And then I think gravel for him is going to be the, the big thing, but it's good. He's playing with mountain bike to get some, you know, add a bit of technical off-road stuff, you know, there as well for the, the more technical spark parts in these gravel races. But yeah, yeah, he came away. So I was psyched on that for sure. And a couple of clients tried some first time, like longest races, biggest climbing of their lives. So we're sort of for a few people trying to just get a bunch of experiences in this fall before snow comes in Canada mm-hmm. and then sort of building towards uh, 2019 and, and big goals with that. So yeah, yeah hopefully everyone, hopefully everyone's taking advantage of the weather while they have it and, and sort of away from major races and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we talked about that last week, how, you know, it sounds like it's kind of early to start thinking about 2019, but really a lot of races fill up already at this point. So if you're not thinking about your 2019 big goals, it might be time to start kind of assessing those. But yeah, so it actually had snowed slightly overnight, so it was around 30 degrees, so just below zero uh, when we started the race, and let me tell you, Robert and I were both on that start line, just grumpy and cold. I forgot what it feels like to start a race like that, Um, and actually, pro tip for anyone who hasn't done a gravel grinder or hasn't done one in the cold before, even though it's a long race, like, you gotta warm up. I didn't, and I was hurting so bad not because I was like my lungs but because my legs were so cold that just to get the blood flowing and really get moving took probably the first 15 minutes so pro tip yeah yeah I mean it always depends on your goals too right like if if you're gonna try and get in and you know set a decent time this race was only somewhere between maybe three and four hours for a lot of people. I think the wind time was 2.40 or something for Robert and Jen. Um, but for a lot of folks, you know, it's they're just out for a ride, right? And if you're going to ease into it, then it's fine. But, yeah, I mean, four, four hours, even a four-hour race is going to have, you know, a couple hard efforts. So even just to stay, even just not to be miserable, right? It, it's nice to spin around and stay warm and, that's Stay sort of what I mean. Yeah, it's not necessarily like, oh, I really want to go at the gun. Like, I had zero intention of really, like, racing this super hard or anything. But just to get in with the group that's actually right around your ability level instead of having to then leapfrog past people because you finally warmed up. And just to not feel like garbage. Like, there were points in the first 5K, and I've never said this in a race, I actually thought about just turning around and going back to the start and just calling it because I felt so yucky in my legs. I just had nothing. So I think if I'd warmed up, I would have been much happier. Well, and that comes, that's sort of a good experience too, right? Is A lot of endurance racing is sort of knowing that there'll be crappy moments over the course of the day and sort of how to pull yourself back and knowing that it'll sort of you'll it'll hit that downhill and you'll feel better or the sun will come out or whatever right the, the sections will end um so sometimes that's you know why we have to go and do all these races in preparation so that you you learn all these things and make all these mistakes mm-hmm. yeah i will also add another mistake i made is my constant mistake in bike racing and bike riding is it was so cold that i definitely didn't drink enough and since my calories were all in my bottles for this that meant I also didn't eat enough. So the last, you know, 15K just really hurt. I'm not going to lie. Um, very hungry afterwards and kicking myself because I know I know better than that. So lessons, yeah, and it really gets... Lessons the, like, we learned. Fa- <laughs> it's fine. The fall, and winter, the fall and winter with eating and then dressing, right? There's a lot of issues there. I know a few people had food in their gels were frozen and their bars are frozen or whatever right and it's it's learning sort of how to avoid that and how to dress appropriately and strip clothing off and you know have enough gloves and stuff like that and Mm -hmm. that all it all comes right it comes with time and that's again why some of these athletes were out there and trying to gain that experience Mm -hmm. um for this race and then just in preparing for this race right and um 
Yeah, it's yeah. pretty, it's pretty uh, funny. You don't really think about how bars can freeze, but if you've ever tried to gnaw your way through like a cliff bar in a tw- that's been outside in 25 degree weather, it's miserable. It's so hard yeah. to do. Yeah, and like personally, I just probably wouldn't bother with solid food in a race. Maybe, maybe one in a race that long if it was actually four hours. But yeah, I don't know. I think you're. That's where it's sort of planning out how that's going to look, right? And how are you going to actually fuel that? Yeah, I have to um, give a shout out to Tailwind. That stuff has been my go-to. It's what got me through the ultra, the run, and it was great for, you know, when I was drinking it on the bike in this. You know, it's just pretty calorically dense. You can get, you know, 400 calories in a bottle, which is pretty sweet. And the taste is just not that intense. So you don't end up feeling, I don't know, gross over it. So I really, really am a huge fan. Right. So now let's. Uh, so it's. What are, what are we at for date here? It's um, for people who might want to make a last minute decision to come to this uh, event this weekend. So that's is October the twenty seventh of two thousand eighteen. Um, and what is the what is the search term? Uh, bittersweet uh, or raspy pizza. Um, I think registration closes the day this is going to air. It might actually even be closed by the time we get this posted, but I'm sure you could email the promoters and they'd let you in. Um, It's, you know, a pretty casual event, but yeah, it should be really fun. And it's out like, it's like Kingdom Trails in Vermont. Exactly. So, I mean, I'll be staying over Saturday night and probably doing a bit of a shred Sunday morning before I head back to Ontario, because when at Kingdom Trails, right? Right. Yes. Yeah. So uh, today we have Jen Jackson on, as you mentioned, and we're talking cross country skiing. We had a listener question about sort of transitioning from, you know, your summer sport, maybe that's cycling, running, whatever you're sort of into. Maybe you just sort of enjoy summer. Uh, How do you get ready for cross country skiing? Uh, Presumably you're in the fall, you know, there isn't optimal conditions for skiing, which is, as I think we joke with Jen, sort of the constant state that cross-country skiers are in uh, is not having great snow or, you know, it's summer or it's fall or whatever. So there, there's lots of tools they have to do that. And cross-country skiers, Jen included, uh, are very good at cross-training. And so they're running and they're pole running and they're doing strength and they, you know, biking and whatever they're into, right? So Jen shares lots of good ideas and a bunch of links, uh, which are in the show notes. Um I'll actually definitely put them in. And yeah, hopefully that is something there for the listener who, who posted that. And thank you for that. And yeah, I don't know. Did you have any other stuff for that, Molly? I mean, I think this was one of my favorite episodes we've done because it's super just boom, actionable, boom, actionable, tons of tips in there. And I mean, for me, as someone who's pretty new to cross-country skiing, um, a, I really like any sport that I don't feel super competent doing where most of the training for it actually doesn't involve doing it. <laughs> um, right. So you can feel like you're making gains even when you're, you know, maybe not out on the skis as much as possible. Uh, and she has some really good tips for people like me who just never really learned how to glide. Um, that's just not something I grew, that's a movement that if you grew up doing it, if you, you know, played hockey, if you ice skated, anything like that, or even skateboarded, you know how to do it or not skateboarded, I guess. Well, kind of. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think it's sliding sports. Anything that's like sort of uncontrollable, um, is, is definitely an asset. I think in mountain biking, I see that with people a lot. If they haven't been out of control and skidded, you know, on skis or a skateboard or something like that, then they get very uncomfortable with anything gravity based. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, so descending on a bike. Yeah. So she's got a lot of really good advice for that, that I'm pretty excited to get out there and try. This well, season. and I think, I think the other cool thing is that this is essentially, we could almost title this as like how to cross train, right? Like mm-hmm. it's essentially, you know, we, we're in, everyone has sort of that crappy season. It could just be rainy or, you know, a little colder or whatever. If you're in, you know, a nice West, other, Southwest destination. Um, but it, it also might be prepping you for cross country skiing. And I think it really gets at that heart of the, you know, the, it, it's more about the journey and not the destination, right? It's, our goal is to get ready for cross country skiing, but in the process, you're learning to do all these different cross training and sort of exist regardless of weather. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. 
Yeah, and I mean, pole running, I would say, I don't know, I always say with my 10,000 hours, I don't know how many hours of those were cycling versus uh, pole running, but there's a, a big chunk there of of running around with poles and, and being sort of crazy like that. But um, yeah, I, I think it's definitely worth uh, taking some of these ideas and playing with them this fall. Absolutely. All right, let's dive in. Enjoy our podcast, our second one with Jen Jackson. Did you go skiing on the weekend? It snowed there? No, we thought about it, though. Uh, if I was, like, full skier mode, it would have been getting out the rock skis and going for a slide around the golf course, but I didn't uh, feel too compelled to do that. Okay, see, until yesterday, I didn't realize that this was a thing that one could do on skis. Oh, it is it ever? <laughs> I was trying to explain the rock ski uh, concept. Oh, yeah, they're just like, it's just like a kind of equivalent of a beater bike but you're just old skis that in very marginal conditions you'd take out just for the sake of being on skis more than anything yeah I think probably a lot of sports have that on some level I think in cycling we could probably do a better job of encouraging people to have like you know a bike that's flat pedals and you know when the weather's really really bad you put on like some snowsuit or like you know slush pants and waterproof pants and you just go and like ride around randomly and slide all yeah I actually saw the greatest thing online. I stumbled across it. It's like this company that does, it's called a dirt suit. And it's just basically a one piece riding rain suit. That would be perfect. You get that and then you get your beater bike and you can ride, you know, all the shoulder seasons. No excuse. Yeah. I would probably just race a lot of the muddy cross races in that on a beater bike. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's some races where it's just like monitoring, like trying not to get hypothermic, right? So this this could be it. I'll send you guys a link. They look pretty stylish too. <laughs> so you, somehow you you also sent me though this two random videos, one more random than the other. But I'll post the links <laughs> for these. We'll assume that we're going here, by the way. But um, <laughs> we're so good at starting podcasts. I mean, we'll we'll intro. Jen's been on before, but um, you sent me this video of two seemingly very elite cross-country skiers cross-country skiing in new york in what appeared to be the summer on the cement but in full race garb what what was the context for that (laughs) oh so like the the guy who posted that video he's he's kind of a he does like a lot of like satire kind of sports comedy in kind of scandinavia so he he kind of he takes these to the next extreme so he does a lot of these videos where they take skiing to urban places and do these bizarre things they've run around shopping malls and cross-country ski gear like full skis poles like sliding around the facilities but it's just mocking the concept of a lot of skiers will do like intervals on skis in the summer on grass and the, the that guy's just doing it for the reaction but it is actually some people actually train that way right Right, and you sent a second video of a group of you know younger skiers. Yeah, the, it seemed like the German and, yeah. national team, I think. And so, like, I'm familiar with the idea of pole running or striding, or you know, there's a variety of terms for it. Um, well, there are, there are, there's differences between them if you're going to talk to a skier. Right. Okay. There are intricacies. I also want to add in roller skiing, though. So what's there, that seems like there's three things, right? We've got the pole running. We've got mm-hmm. the skiing on grass, and then we've got roller skiing, which, yeah, is, so which is legit. <laughs> r- roller skiing is what we'll do most of the time, and it's kind of the most effective training. Uh, and then you do a lot of ski walking or striding, and then the one where you're wearing skis is kind of... that. That's, that's more of a niche. Like, if you have a coach who's kind of into it, or if you just want to do something different... But that's kind of the least common, just because it is awkward and. Okay, well let's 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 add some sort of like structure to this then. So if someone were getting ready, you know, maybe they don't have that much experience, but they want to do a bit of racing even this year. You know, they're coming from maybe cycling or maybe a bit of running, or you know, they've stayed active over the summer. Um, you know, we're in this sort of shoulder season, which I think is just how cross country skiers live their life in this shoulder season, <laughs> hoping there'll be snow. Yeah. Um, so so how do you get ready? Like, what are the you know, we covered those three things, and then probably there's strength training with that. So, why don't we start with the what was the first one? That was like the the pole walking, striding type stuff. Yeah. Well, let's start with that. I, well, that's definitely the most accessible 
way to get ready for the ski season. Like roller skis, roller skiing is a little bit expensive, but pole walking, all you need is a set of poles. You, they could be the ones you use for skiing in the winter. Typically, they're a bit shorter like, than uh, so more like your classic skis, like yeah, they'd be like a, yeah, classic poles. You know, somewhere between if you're holding them in your hands upright, your elbows would be kind of between ninety. And then upwards a little bit, so like between 90 and I guess like 70 degrees, kind of up. And that's just so you can actually use your arms. If the poles are too long, then you're just hanging off the poles and you won't actually get any strength or power through the poles. So from a technique perspective, you kind of lose that there. And most of, with pole walking, it would be mostly for classic technique because it's difficult to simulate the gliding and the lateral movement of skating with poles. So you would ski walk and then for skate skiing, which I think most people is how they would transition into skiing. Very few people just start classic skiing these days if they're not already uh, into skiing. So like just bounding on a hill, like stuff like that is like very specific to getting ready to the kind of the, the skiing technical elements. Okay. So you could go to, you know, so you have sort of, you're walking around maybe on a trail or, you know, wherever um Mm -hmm. generally you're aiming for uphill though because it's yeah because otherwise it's hard to it's hard to work hard enough without good technique on the flats and ski walking is different than just walking with poles like there is it's a it's a very deliberate action whereas you kind of you see like a lot of elderly people walking with poles to get a little bit of exercise and strength for their upper body but pole walking ski walking sorry (laughs) It involves, like, you really push down into the ground as if you're compressing the camber of the ski. Right. Like, that's what you're trying to simulate is the downward force of, like, getting the grip wax onto the snow and then pushing off. And then the return of your leg is returning, kind of swinging through like skiing, and you're not bringing your heel up like running. Right, right. I could, there's, there's lots of good videos, and I'll send you guys some of them. Okay, because sure. when, when, you, when you see it, it looks very different than just hiking with poles, which is a good start, but if you're looking to actually develop more of the specific strength and some technical elements, you'd benefit a lot more from kind of researching it a bit and then going out and doing it. Right, and so definitely the, the, the key thing is that your arms should be helping propel you forward, right? Like it's, yeah, absolutely. It, it shouldn't be just running and like pounding the pole into the ground while you run. It's, it's No, you actually are pushing off with your pole. And like ski walking is probably one of the single best, I'd say ski walking uphill like hard ski walking is better for technique than roller skiing because on the roller ski you always have perfect grip because it's just a ratchet whereas skiing you need to work on that kind of very sharp motion to get your grip wax onto the snow and you can't really do that on roller skis the grip actually gets worse the harder you kick because then the ratchet will slip right okay if you have a good example of that then we'll do that so we have sort of get outside do some hikes use some poles try and research the form a little bit, um, you know, over time, maybe adding some sort of intensity, like extra intensity to that, like you would start doing intervals. Is it only intervals or is it like it's worth doing steady, like, you know, hour sessions even? Oh yeah. Like we would go out and do like, just go out for a three hour ski walk, just right. around the park, just go around. And, like usually you'd be on ski trails. Like if you go to a ski center, then you have the terrain that you'd ski on in the winter. Mm-hmm. But it, generally especially in the fall a lot of it would be for intervals and that would turn from ski walking to ski striding or bounding where there's actually air time and you just go like up a ski hill or you pick a kind of the appropriate grade for the level of intensity you want right right and that might naturally for people who don't that might naturally be an easier way for people to get this specific the technique yeah yeah exactly it's a little bit easier because there's momentum with it that once you get the hang of it, it requires less thought there's just that I, momentum I think, will carry I think that makes sense right because it's like if you go to the hill and you're like i'm going to use these poles to like bound up the hill it sort of makes yep. sense you're sort of like trying to like bound up the hill right and you get that skiing sensation a bit more yeah for sure um and then definitely like having done some runs with you and stuff like the the when you say three hours like it is possible to do it but it's just being patient and and going slow yeah, you, slow, you enough, go right? slow. Like, <laughs> you walk like you basically walk up a lot of the hills right and yeah and that's how you do it but the poles are really cool because you can do a little longer you know than most cyclists especially could run normally 
But again, well, you have to be with patient. ski walking, you don't have the impact, right? Like right. it's that's I think what ho- holds most cyclists and kind of non runners back with running is just how demanding it's just the impact that you know their legs get sore from the impact not necessarily because they're not strong right. but because they don't have the technique to run smoothly and efficiently okay so okay running so on trails too roller skiing like you say is maybe more niche probably a lot of people don't aren't comfortable either with the risk or it's too hard to get out doing it um, yeah okay. it's skis. not that ex- <laughs> expensive it's, it's a niche thing right yeah, it's pretty pretty specific. If someone like was going to go roller skiing, like what type of, like they can research the where to get them and so forth. Um, I'm sure your local ski shop can help you or in online or whatever, but um, what what type of terrain, like in your ideal world, would, would you you'd ideally go up like a mountain basically and get picked up? Yeah, if you have the, if you have the luxury of having someone who will pick you up at the top of a hill, then that's good. But flat, like flat undulating terrain. I live in Oro, so there's lots of, Oromodonte and your hardwood ski and bike and there's lots of just gentle rolling terrain like you can pick up a lot of speed on roller skis on hills so you have to kind of plan your route and know where you're going but anywhere with smooth asphalt and flat undulating terrain is ideal really like bike paths are quite good as long as it's not a busy one because you take up a lot of space on roller skis yeah but you have to have pretty smooth pavement because the wheels are so small and hard. If you get on anything rough, it's just, oh. it's slow and it's miserable. Who was I with? I think I was with uh, Sarah the other day riding and we uh, we saw a lady doing roller skiing on like a very leafy gravel path. Oh yeah, that's sketchy. It, yeah, I mean it was resistance. It would be like doing it on grass, I guess. But... It's kind of like uh, backcountry skiing, I suppose. <laughs> It kind of is. The leaves, the leaves on asphalt though, get slippery before they get yeah. uh, before they get sticky. So it's actually just kind of dangerous. Yeah, I don't know. It's always scared me. But uh, so that's that's roller skiing. So that's an obvious way people get ready. Uh, what else are we missing here? I guess strength training would be another. Is there anything like beyond just getting strong and you know maybe doing more upper body than maybe a cyclist usually would? Is there anything in particular like you're not? doing crazy arm swings or like anything like that in the gym that's like mimicking the ski motion um well some some gyms they have ski ergs right they I was kind of are the... you were gonna say that peter's like <laughs> campaigning for one so <laughs> well well i mean it, you think about when you go to the gym you'll do like a jogging warm-up which you know kind of warms you all up but you don't get any activation for your upper body before you do upper body exercises mm-hmm. so erging for five you know, even five minutes, you get pretty warm doing that. And that's a very specific, you know, that's a full, erging can be a full body exercise because it's like double pulling, which you get a lot of glute and kind of hip flexor engagement when you double pull as well. And we'll maybe just back up to it. It's essentially like a rowing machine, but the, the rower portion, the fan is like up towards the roof and you're holding two handles basically or two ropes. Yeah, and you pull the ropes, ropes down. And you pull the ropes sort of using your double pulling ski motion, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, so there's there's that, but then a lot of medicine ball throws. Yeah, I guess you could do like a ball slam. Is that what you're thinking? Yeah, that yeah, thing? that's kind of that's the big one. And then you know there's variations of that, like from lying down, like kind of doing an explosive sit up, throwing a ball, sure. or just any kind of dynamic motion with a like because skiing at like a competitive level, level it, it 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 does become very dynamic. Right. So you there's need to have of, that. Ex- like you mean like a lot of double pulling. Yeah, and just it's an all explosive force application because it's all about acceleration. Right, like it's ex- accelerating on the snow. So any motion like that, but just for like general purpose in the gym, I'd say just the stability, like the endurance strength for most people who are just tra- skiing for training, is where you'd benefit the most. Like being able to do twenty five or thirty push ups in a row, being able to do pull ups is a huge one. Mm-hmm. Well, the back is huge, right? So I was even thinking dips as well it seems fairly specific. Yeah, triceps, yeah. for sure. Or just a narrow, to your point on push-ups, you could do a narrow push-up, I guess, would be pretty similar to mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. And then... Like, I love and hate push-ups because you get, like, the core stability, which in skiing, like, because it's, it's so balanced, so much balance is involved, too, having good connectivity kind of between your, like, upper and lower, like, your 
your upper back and then down like through your hips and like your trunk being able to be stable and generate power and balance through there is super back important pain, like i don't know if with trained skiers is back pain a big thing or is that more like again sort of the the cyclist the non-professional skier coming to skiing that has that no a lot especially with more double pulling becoming more and more kind of heavily weighted in skiing just becoming more demanding a lot of skiers are kind of straining backs and having to kind of having to deal with that and I'm not exactly sure like other than because these are athletes who are doing all the like doing lots of stability and core work and stuff it's just sometimes you tweak it Mm -hmm. but making sure you do not just you know your abdominals but kind of you know your obliques lower back yeah exercises too yeah, I think you need to train it, right? And there's a lot of stuff around, you know, sit-ups are bad or, you know, this is bad. But, you know, it, the reality is that so much of life and sport involves, you know, flexion of the back, flexion of the spine. <laughs> yeah. It's important, right? There's no way to avoid it. Um, we've had Greg Lehman on the podcast who's uh, very good at sort of looking at all these different studies and stuff. He's a chiro biomechanist and a physiotherapist. And uh, that's sort of his life passion is around pain and that... <laughs> That's weird thing sounds to say. Off. <laughs> yeah, well, sounds awful. It, it does, but I mean, he's very comical, so he sort of he, he makes it better. But um, yeah, that's that's the reality. He looks at all these different sports, right? And it's impossible to do even a squat that they say is you know the spine is stable still has some like it's like thirty percent flexion in the lower spine or something. Um, and if you look at gymnastics or you know cycling, even right, like there's all this stuff where people are fine forever. So. I think a lot of it is just conditioning and like the gradual exposure, right? And maybe with skiing, it's something like, you know, doing back extension. And there's like some of the gymnastic stuff would actually be really interesting. There's a move called like the Jefferson curl, which is basically like bending over to like tie your shoes, but in like the most like bendy way you could, like using like curling one vertebrae at a time. So rather than like hinging at the hips, like we're all taught is the proper lifting strategy. So there's like, all these different ways that I guess could help train that low back, but your ball throw is probably a good one. And then just any of the basic, whatever you call core stability stuff, back extension. Yeah. And like, not necessarily like just like the static, but then also, you know, moving, like you can do planks where then you're, you know, you're extending in a certain direction and from a plank you move. Like I think the plank is like the best exercise, yeah. strength exercise ever. Well, there's plank, and there's what about even like a rollout or a, a pike or something like that too would be. I'd like rollouts if I was better at them, but they're just really hard. <laughs> well, the, I, I've said this before, like I really like the ab wheel, A, because it's comical, but B, like if you ease into it, like if you want to do pull-ups, it helps with that. But then it's also like getting towards like those crazy planks, right? But you have to ease into it and be very careful because the ab wheel will injure everyone. Yeah, they'll hurt you. Um, I remember I interviewed uh, Brad Huff, the pro cyclist, and he said he was just trying to keep up with his girlfriend, Lauren Hall, doing the ab rollers, and he like pulled something in his stomach. Oh. Yeah. Womp, no. Womp. You always see it. Yeah, you don't need a lot. But uh so that's that's good. So that's strength and then I like that you mentioned the erg. Um We're still not getting one. I'm trying to think. So what else? Let's just pull up this question here. Let's make sure we we had a very in-depth listener question, so we wanted to go to the source here with Jen. I actually have a question here. Okay, Molly's Molly's on year 2 of her progression, so she's still in the fundamentals phase of skiing, but uh, <laughs> uh so I don't glide. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> So that's my issue. Like I can, I can keep going for like two hours, but I can't glide. So maybe because there's no snow, how could Molly get better at gliding is our question here in the run up to ski season. Or once there's snow. Well, gliding, you need to be able to balance on your ski to glide first. Mm Mm-hmm. So is it like, do you find that you're falling off of your ski or do your skis not literally not glide? Because then you might just need new skis. Uh, no, it's not her (laughs) skis as much as like, she does the like, (laughs) it's like, and she's gotten better, but like, it's just the shuffling and the concept that like, you can be sort of semi out of control gliding. Um, Mm -hmm. right. So, but it is, I think that like confidence in the one ski you'll also see this in ice skating. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a terrible ice skater. So she won't like glide foot to foot. It's more shuffling. So yeah, I would say. Well, well, I mean, like for either classic or skate skiing, it's just being comfortable being on one foot, like getting getting the weight shift is 
amongst new skiers and, you know, even at a high level, being able to commit to one ski and be stable balancing on one foot, not, you know, they call it sitting in the middle when you're skate skiing, if you just kind of almost will tilt side to side to get your weight over as opposed to like actually shifting your weight over your ski. And one way that's kind of, that's good to think about it is if you're either classic or skate to encourage yourself to get onto the one ski is to think about putting the weight on the outside of your foot. So think about putting weight onto your pinky toe, like, and the outside, as opposed to weight to the inside, like big toe, kind of the ball of your foot. Oh, I like that. So I used to be an Irish dancer, so I spent a lot of time on my toes. So I think when I try to balance, it is more on like the big toe kind of thing. So that's actually a really good cue. And then that, when you're on your big toe, then your knee tends to collapse inward. Mm -hmm. But if you shift your weight, think about more standing on the outside of your ski, outside of your foot, then it'll naturally pull your knee out a little bit more, get you more weight shift. And then you probably have just a flatter foot. Mm Mm-hmm which yeah, will help too. And that's really like, it's more that you're trying to pull someone out. And I think you'd see that Molly does like in skates and the classic like person on skates is like the foot collapsing in, right. Or the skate collapsing mm-hmm. in. Um, so that's, I think a good cue. I'm wondering too, like something like a, you know, jumping. So bounding, I guess like side to side hop, which they do call skaters if you do it dynamically. Uh, oh yeah. You do lots of those for ski, yeah. especially this time of year when you're kind of doing, little bit more explosive stuff and then being able to catch yourself on that foot and catch like when you land just land and not need to take that stutter step to kind of regain your balance i wonder about skating like you know they have indoor skating do cross-country skiers ever use skating i've never skated and i don't know anyone who does wow (laughs) because i bet you could though i bet you'd be able to skate i bet you you'd be able to skate i'm sure you'd be able to skate (laughs) you have never ice skated like when I was a kid, oh, when you, I was a kid, okay. we did a little bit. But we'll like, trade off. I'll show you how to skate, and then you can show me how to ski. Yeah. I feel like this is no, going to be I'm really just... embarrassing for you, Peter. I am, <laughs> I am a tremendous skater. You're all right. Oh. <laughs> I'm a very no, ha- hack up, skier. Up on that. <laughs> I'm like I'm like the skier. I don't know what an analogy for this, but like I've come out of like the forest, and no one's like ever given me instruction. Basically, that's not 100 percent true. Some people have given me instruction. Well, I but... I think a lot of people never go for a lesson. Yeah. With skiing. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know why it is, but if you go for a lesson, like a lot of ski places will have just um you know they'll have you can sign up and do a group lesson, but I'd say you like going and getting. A, a ski coach like from a club or like someone who's nccp certified in my opinion is going to do more to kind of get you skiing technically well than someone coming from like a i don't want to knock can see but it, that's very much like nccp is kind of the racing side where you kind of have the athlete development like how they would teach kids to ski and in my opinion their model of introducing people to technique is much better right. than the kind of the way can see goes about it just having seen both myself yeah i mean it's such a technique driven sport right like you can see the people that it's like swimming in so many ways um you know the people who have the technique down can basically you know just move around the trail you know and they're barely barely working right like a good skier or a good swimmer can just go all day right well and that's that's kind of one of the the different things that i that it, I think is holding skiing back from growing in Canada is that a lot, very few people do it when they're young. So very few people become proficient at it at that kind of critical skill acquisition phase. And then as you get older, you know, that intuitive balance and the movement patterns, because it's such a technique intensive sport, you know, people aren't, don't really just get into it. It doesn't become something they do. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. They, uh, Terry Orlick, who's one of, he founded, uh, what was it? Total immersion swimming. Uh, and he had the term adult onset swimmer. Um, <laughs> so I feel like skiing is sort of similar, right? You gotta yeah. get that set up. And as an adult onset swimmer, I definitely appreciated that. But, uh, I, I think you're right. Cause I mean, I definitely learned, like we went skiing a fair bit when I was younger and my parents always encouraged us. And then we went for school, went every year four or five times and, I worked mm-hmm. at a cross country ski place, and it was definitely, I think, doing it younger when you're willing to crash and fool around, and you know, like we just for fun, we're, we're doing like you know the the skateboard thing that they do sometimes as a drill, even right where you take off yep. one ski. Like we would just screw around and do that and see if we could go down the entire like big hill, you know, down well, down the hill on one ski, right? And and that that is what 
youth practices for skiing are like it's all it, all the technical almost all the technique for kids is like it's just play it's all just games it's kind of in the courses I've taken it's all trying to trick them into doing technique without making it be about technique right right like doing those single ski drills where you just scooter around and place place on snow soccer with one ski and then you suddenly have these kids who are great at gliding on one ski because they only have one ski on and they're just messing around though so they learn really quick i think we'll leave it on that that's play Mm -hmm. um but those are good you've covered sort of the the what are we calling it the pole walking (laughs) uh, uh, this is a very contentious thing but get it with your poles whether you're walking or running, um, doing maybe a bit of bounding uphill, working on that technique uh, in the gym, working on that low back especially, also the upper body strength. Um, your discretion on the roller skis. And, yeah, anything else? No, this is getting me fired up for ski season now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, with that snow, you have to be. All right, Jen, cool. thank you. We'll let you get on with your day. Yeah, yeah you. thanks. Good to chat with you guys. Later. You too. Bye. Thanks so much for tuning into the Consummate Athlete Podcast. Uh, you can check out my stuff over at theoutdooredit.com or by following me on Instagram and Twitter at Molly J. Herford. And you can check out Peter's coaching, training plans, blogs, all that fun stuff over at smartathlete.ca or by following him on Twitter and Instagram at Peter Glassford. And if you want to support this show and other awesome podcasts, please check out WideAnglePodium.com for show info, other podcasts, bonus content, and to become a donating member so you can get all of that rad behind-the-scenes content and help keep shows like this on the air. And lastly, if you're enjoying this podcast and all the information that we're bringing to you every single week, Uh, Do us a solid and pop into iTunes to leave us a rating and review. Takes you about two seconds. You can do it on your computer. You can do it on your phone. And it really helps us out. Thanks so much. And we will see you next week.